What is up, guys? My name is Kristen. My name is Sarah. And welcome to the Red Rum and Red Wine Podcast. Yeah, this story is, not gonna lie, has nothing to do with true crime, but it's morbid as fuck, so it, like, fits the bill, you know? Hell yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, we're, today, we're going to talk about the underground children that live in Romania. Ooh. Now, I'm so sorry, I feel like I really should have looked at this before. <gasps> what was that? What was What? Stop. I have specs. No, like in your galaxy light behind you, Mm -hmm. there was like a shadow that went across the light. Oh, Simba. Oh. (laughs) Stop it. Because it's on the ground and Simba just walked. fucking scared the shit out of me i thought you were gonna tell me that like some a man pops up behind me yeah no if you see something that's see that's simba's asshole right there (laughs) we're good we're good guys i'm safe i'm safe okay um but no, where was I? This is, <laughs> his tail just got the back of my neck, and I'm sorry, that freaked me out. But this is actually, um, I was scrolling through Twitter, and this popped up. Huh? I just see my door open, and then I see a figure. I'm like, fuck. <laughs> just like, ugh. It's a lot of creepy shit happening like, know. in a row. I know. My heart like really just needs a second. Are really... you okay? Yeah, I'm good. She like, I guess I'm making a lot of noise and she was like, is he asleep? I was like, yes, what the fuck are you doing in my doorway? Close the door. Starts fucking crying. I thought it was Simba and then I see a figure. I'm like, no, that's a fucking human being. What the fuck? <laughs> But then I realized they're not wearing pants. And I'm like, oh, it's just my mom. <laughs> it's like a t-shirt and then like legs. <laughs> no, I just see the skinny legs. And I'm immediately, I'm like, oh, it's Shirley. <laughs> God, I really don't know how much of this is going to make it in. But <laughs> I wish this skeleton hand could actually fan me up. Right. <laughs> Oh, but anywho, <laughs> thankfully, what I mean, it is scary what we're talking about. But I was scrolling through TikTok and I at for the underdogs video popped up and she was talking about a documentary that she had seen some 20 years ago about how abortion was made illegal in Romania, along with contraception and how it basically led to all of these children having to live underground. Now I get into the details later, but it gets pretty fucking wild. So yeah. Let's... Uh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> it sounds like surface level. It sounds sad as fuck. But then like beyond that, it's, it's pretty... like, okay, actually kind of creepy. It's creepy considering what is happening in the United States right now. For those don't who don't know, like abortion is roe v wade which is a woman's right to abortion is literally about to probably be taken away this coming month next month by the supreme court so and you're starting to see a lot of republican parties start to push to like get iud's or even go as far as get condoms banned so to see something like this happen and then do research on something like this it's very eerie and it's kind of scary um i'm not trying to make it political by any means but i just think that you know it's something that has happened in history and it's something that's worth talking about so let's go ahead and get into it yeah 
So to get started, and we I'm have just... vaginas, so we can talk about it and have opinions about it. So we can <laughs> say whatever we want about it. But starting with the abortion laws in Romania, or just kind of like in Europe in general. So under the Penal Code of 1864, this was following the principalities of Moldovia and Wallachia, which I guess were like the governing, I don't even know, some like government bullshit. But this penal code of 1864 banned any type of abortion all throughout Europe. Now, this would basically stay in place until 1936 when Romania's 1936 criminal code would exempt abortion if it meant that it would save a pregnant person's life or if the child showed any type of severe genetic disorder. Now, Romania's 1936 criminal code would stay in place until 1957 when abortion was finally made legal, in which 80% of the pregnancies at the time would end up in abortion. Uh, But this was due to the fact that really no contraception in Romania was offered at the time. So, like, really the only form of contraception that these people had was either, like, the pull-out method or abortion, so. Or abstinence. Yeah, but what the (laughs) fuck? Who the fuck is going to do that? Come on. (laughs) Realistic. We want realistic options here only. Okay. So by 1966, uh, the birth rate had actually fallen from 19.1 births per 1,000 to 14.3 once abortion was made legal. And really, the Romanian regime, regime, however you want to say it, (laughs) but they would basically like attribute this fall in the birth rate solely to abortion becoming illegal or uh, abortion becoming legal. And once former communist leader, Nick, I'm so sorry. I'm going to say a lot of names wrong because I'm not in the States. So former leader. You are in the state. Wait. <laughs> I'm not in this United States for this story. I'm in Romania. Mm-hmm. Oh. But <laughs> former communist. <laughs> former. God damn you, 19 crimes. You're getting me. Okay. Former communist leader Nikolai. Sisaku, um, in an effort to increase the nation's workforce, would just go ahead and outlaw both contraception and abortion through the decree 770. Though they would like make some weird exceptions. I know, like, one rule I'm going off of the top of my head, but like, one of the rules was that if you were 40 and over, then you would be allowed to have an abortion but I guess like too many women over the age of 40 were getting it so then they raised the age to 45 but then after some years they would like lower it back down so you would start to see like they would have these quote-unquote exceptions but it was exceptions that the government was like at the will of and would often change to fit whatever birth rate agenda that they had in mind Mm. They would even go as far as finding wedding couples substantial amounts of money if they did not have children. And they would even give government titles to women that had more than the required amount of children. So they were going through drastic measures in order to make sure that these people were having babies. Um, It even when that did not work, got to the point where regardless of your marital status didn't marry matter if you were single or if you were married or if you were a boy or a girl male or female if you did not have children you would be fined monthly contributions but i mean it worked so good for the romanian government they would see the birth rate go from 14.3 per 1000 to 27. Four per 1,000 by 1967. Now, even though the government is forcing these people to have children, by no means are they giving any type of aid to raise the child. Because, like, why would they? That's just silly. Uh, instead, leader Nikolai 
cockapoo-poo imposed an autistry aut- <laughs> policy. I'm so sorry, but cockapoo-poo. I don't. I'm not going to say his last name. I literally don't know how to pronounce it. But he deserves that last name because what he does, it's an, I'm saying this wrong. It's an autistry. Aut- Austerity. Austerity. It's an austerity policy which basically orders citizens to pay out government's external debt that was incurred by the state during the 1970s. And when I read this, I was like, is this where we're headed? Because we have a huge external debt incurred by the United States. And yeah, what better way than to like get the people to pay for it? Which, hmm. This made the already difficult task of raising children because, I don't know, I was reading into it and they said that, like, uh, the unemployment rate was fairly low when this Nikolai person was in office, but at the same time, it was, like, still kind of sketchy because then you get all of these additional payments and so it was making it really hard to have these kids. And then once he imposed these this autistry policy, it basically, like, everyone was running out of money and you were kind of, like, seeing the fall of communism start to happen. And so when the fall of communism began, really you would see a lot of parents begin to forfeit their children to orphanages. You would really see during this time that orphanages were filled with not really parents that had died, but rather just parents that couldn't afford to have their kids anymore. And they just were like, you know what, take them. Or it was the fact that they never wanted them in the first place. And so they thought it best to just give them to the orphanage. By no means were these orphanages safe places to, you know, drop your children off. I know morbid had explained a couple of episodes ago how terrible the ones in the states were the ones in romania are no better no better there was talk of giving children aids infected transfusions in hopes of like making them sick and like killing them off what the Um, fuck yeah there was a lot of human trafficking like children they had in one article i read a kind of like agreement with a taxi service. It was like mainly British people, <laughs> apparently. Sorry, Britain, but it was British people that would go, I guess, to this area. And then they would get in a taxi with a child and drive around the park or along this set route that they knew they wouldn't get caught while the child performed like whatever acts. It's just like this. And if they weren't doing that, then they were fucking chained to the bed as found in like another orphanage. It was just like purely inhuman. No one wants to stay there. It's not livable. No one should have to live that way kind of like situation. And so it's like, do you want your left leg or your right leg cut off? And so really it was just an all around shit time for these children children born during this time would actually be nicknamed decreedy from the decree 770 in which a lot of them became born under because abortion was made illegal a lot of them also like in the documentary you would see maybe a few but it was also like kind of a jab as to a lot of the mental and physical damages that these children received due to the risky pregnancies that were going on or the failed abortions that the mothers would try to do and then it didn't work and now their children are maimed or physically disabled. Yeah, or it works, but the mom's dead, too. Mm -hmm. And I get into that very shortly. It would take until 1990 for the policy to be reversed and for abortion to be made legal again up into the 14th week. But like Sarah had said, by the time that this happened, many of the women of Romania had died, and it was estimated that about nine to 10,000 of them had lost their lives, about 500 a year, one article stated, from botched abortions from 1965 to 1989. And you know what? 
I don't know how big Romania is. Is it big? Do you know? One is more than enough. One is more than enough. Yeah, I know. I but don't. Still, I don't I'd know like how big it think, is though. Um, or I'd like to know just to put it in perspective. Per capita. Yeah, I I personally don't know, but I I don't imagine it here. Pause. Romania okay. is two point eight times smaller than Texas. Ah, uh, that is. So that's a lot, right? For that. Tiny that's size? fucking insane. That's fucking insane. Well, Texas and I can't is about to have at more. that time it was as populated as, you know. Holy fucking shit balls. That's insane. That's yeah, I thought Romania was at least like, I don't know. I forget, dude, that Europe is like smaller than the United States. Some some of yeah, Europe, like, like Britain and Isn't all Texas those. bigger than England? Yeah. Well, one guy was saying on TikTok, he was like, it I blows my mind that, that you have TikTok. to get like, you have to drive six hours to get out of one state and three hours you're already in like two like different countries. Yeah. yeah. I was like, what the fuck? Time works differently for you Europeans, man. You got it nice. It's all the roundabouts y'all have. Hmm. <laughs> Is it? <laughs> yeah, for traffic. <laughs> I read in an article once. <laughs> but as for the children, once communism fell, many of them either really had the option to stay in the orphanages or leave, which considering the conditions that they were put under in the orphanages, many of them left. And at the same time, you also had children running away from them from their impoverished impoverished homes i'm so sorry i can't talk <laughs> it's a lot of kids on the streets mm. it was estimated that about twenty thousand children during this time would be forced onto the streets hmm. yeah given limited resources or options for shelters many of them really had no options but to live day to day not knowing where they were going to sleep or where their next meal was going to come from and really these kids were a dirty quote unquote dirty reminder of the past and it became such an inconvenience i guess for people to see them among the streets that they would push them further deep into the subway where I guess they could at least be somewhat away from society's eye and, like, not as much of an eyesore or a oh. reminder of the policies that were put in place so long ago. Oh, my God. But this is where, like, this documentary is basically taking place. Um, it was released in 2001, and like I said, it, the name of it is Children Underground. It was both directed and produced by Adette Bellsberg, and with this documentary, Adet finds five children who are living in the subway station within Bucharest, Romania, and this is essentially what the documentary is about. She follows them around for some time, and then at the end, she does find them a year later and gives somewhat of a small, like, five-minute update at the end. But uh, I will leave it linked down below. I highly recommend that anyone... it doesn't even matter like your view on the subject but if you just want to know about a consequence of something in history then it was very eye-opening it, it was very it. eye-opening i do not talk it's like a hour and 48 minutes i had to rent it on youtube it's only like three dollars but um it's on youtube or you can get it on like amazon there are a lot of options where you can get it but you do have to purchase it but very cheap very eye-opening and yeah let's talk about it so the, i'm sorry but i might mention if it's that kind of educational historical type of documentary it might be accessible through your university university online library it might be accessible through your university online library resource if you have that have oh, one smart. like the mm -hmm. they have databases that include um like a shit ton of resources that includes video libraries and because I had a specific class a few semesters ago where I had to watch like over the span of the semester watch multiple documentaries 
Yeah. Um, and it had to do with different cultures. So I had to pick a different culture than mine and watch a documentary on it. And I found it through that database. And so this sounds like the type of documentary that might be on those kind of educational databases as well. Yeah, I know this one. For free. It, it was on, it got a ton of awards whenever it first came out. It got like a Sundance Film Festival award and then it like got nominated for some big award. Like this director has had a lot of um, documentaries that they've released that have done really well and have um, done really good. And I don't know, it's just, it's crazy to watch because it's, you know, based in the 90s and so it's very the film is old school and yeah. it's it's just a very i don't know watching it it was just so crazy to look at and then yeah oh okay i just got to talk about it cuz the ending yes. it it just yeah it gets really sad but one of the first people that you're introduced to in this documentary is 16 year old Christina now Christina grew up in an orphanage never knowing who her parents were And she said that as a little girl, she was very tortured, stating that at this orphanage, they would often beat her up or even go as far as forcing them to take off their clothes. But Christina was very much a fighter and would often fight back with them. And because of this, the orphanage, long story short, didn't want to tolerate her and decided that they were going to send her to an insane asylum where Christina ultimately decided, I'm not going to do that. I'm not crazy. I don't feel the need to go to this asylum. I would rather try my luck out on the streets. And so she moved out to the streets and began her life. Uh, she was only 11 at the time. And though she is a girl, she does shave her head and tell everyone that she is a boy so that so smart no one messes with her very yes because rape and sexual assault is a very very common thing that you can face while on the streets so game of thrones level shit yeah (laughs) it's and not even from the people other people that live on the street but from the fucking citizens like it's disgusting but yeah it's something that you have to be very aware of like christina would say as a young girl like you know i was very beautiful and you look at her and she is even with a shaved head like girl fucking rocks it like she (laughs) is a very beautiful girl she says as a young girl you know many would have taken advantage of me but because of this i told shaved my head and i told him i was a real boy for boys it's easy you know what do you expect boys they can escape but girls they won't escape it's hard it's hard for them to escape she would later go on to tell a debt another thing that she would state is that it's not good to give in no not to be a mute not to be quiet if they hit i hit back the fist that's what matters and this is the type of like a bad bitch energy that kind of like lands her into the leader position of this group that is living in this subway station and they're in piata Vic- victory i'm gonna say all of these names wrong but it's like this place in romania like i guess a little bit past bucharest i don't have a map and i'm also not from there i'm so sorry i don't know the geographical locations of everything but it's the certain part in the subway station where the kids have just really thrived and it's messy because it is children running it but i guess it's kind of like a chaotic kind of just like peace i don't know it's it's really fucked up there's nothing peaceful about it really but like it's organized chaos yeah you're just kind of like doing the best you can with what you got and christina really did do her best like it's kind of sweet like she puts herself into this mother kind of role and really she says she doesn't beat him but like she she does <laughs> but she kind of holds them accountable if some of the other children steal she'll tell them like you need to pay the shopkeeper back she also will go to shopkeepers and find jobs for her or the other children to do 
So they're not like necessarily begging on the street for money. She would go on to say in the documentary, like, you know, shopkeepers need assistance. And so I'll always be there to give them a helping hand. She's just like, it, it's hard because I imagine me on the streets and I'm just like, I'm done. I'm not going to try. I'm not going to do anything. So when I see these people that are so aspiring, like in the situation that they have, it's like, I don't know, just stirs up such an emotion. But for her being such a young girl, she really did try to take on such responsibilities for the role that she was in. Yeah. Being in the situation that she was in. Like, did she do it perfectly? No. But who would in that situation? You know, like you're dealing with not knowing who your parents are, not knowing where your next meal is going to be, where you're going to sleep. Like, they said not it was some. Not getting raped, not getting found yeah. out, not getting like. And she shaved her head, but there were definitely times in the documentary where, like, there was one time where a guy kind of, like, put her his arm around him, uh, Christina. So I, even though she tells them I'm a real boy, like, I, it's kind of, I think, like, people know, like, oh, Well, you know. yeah, by the time she's older, probably, but. Yeah. I don't know. Mm. She does the best that she can to really keep these. I don't like, I'm not even joking. They're like eight to 12 year olds in line because Christina is 16 at this time. Now, one of the eight to 12 year olds that we meet next are brother and sister Anna and Marianne. Now, Anna is 10 years old at this time. And Anna's story is that she had decided to leave her mom's impoverished home about two years prior to this documentary taking place. And after about a year of living out on the streets, decides to go back to the family home, not to live, but to go basically, like, kidnap her brother and, like, take her back out on the streets. Like, we later get into an interview, but um, the stepdad would say, like, she broke a window and came in and, like, took him in the middle of the night. I was like, oh, shit, Anna. Like, fuck. But... Anna does really well on the streets. It's kind of like her vibe. She just does very well. <laughs> but you see in the documentary that for Marion, it's not the same. He is sleeping a lot and he always looks really miserable. But uh, who wouldn't? Who? Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry, but who wouldn't? Like, it's, like, it's hey, all I got time for is sleep, baby. Yeah, it's very much like... <laughs> He just doesn't seem like he's having a good time, not going to lie. But the it would be said that, like, her father or stepfather, one of the two, would go as far as finding both of them, or at least Anna, on the streets and bringing her back home. But And this happened, like, two or three times. But each time, within a couple of hours or within a few days or weeks of being back at the house, Anna would just go back out onto the streets So we later, I do get into like an interview that goes on with her mom and the parents. And so we kind of like get into the reasoning of why they may not go out and look for them. But it's kind of just like they're out doing their own thing. And it's, Hmm. it's just is what it is. And like what year? Oh, um, just Two, kidding. You, 2001. You said the documentary was released in 2001, but it was like so made it's in like, the 90s. Yeah, like the late 90s. Okay. Yeah. Adette would ask, or like someone who's interviewing the pair during the documentary would ask Anna, you know, like, why did you want to take your eight year old brother with you out onto the streets? And Anna would essentially say, you know, he didn't like living at home, and this is something that he also wanted. And so. I just did the right thing and I took him with me. There may be another reason, though, that Anna is acting like this. Um, And it explains kind of maybe a lot of the reasoning behind what a lot of these kids do. And that is Orlock, which if you do not know what that is, it is a paint thinner that kids who typically lived on the streets of Romania, loved to huff and get high off of. It may not be for what you think it is. It wasn't 
I guess, essentially used to get high, even though you felt freaking high as a kite when you took it. But a lot of these kids experienced great hunger pains when they were out on the streets because they are not guaranteed a meal. And sometimes when you get high, you don't feel hungry. So a lot of these kids would, and you're fucking homeless and you you don't have parents and like all of this is and you're eight shit and it's like cures hunger and it makes me feel good fuck yeah yeah i'm like i don't even have to be eight to take that give it to me now (laughs) just like so it's it's an unfortunate thing that you do see amongst street kids but they really do enjoy this paint and I do talk about it later. It's really accessible to them and it's fairly cheap. So when people give them money, sometimes instead of buying food, they'll buy this paint and they'll have it. Oh. And I'm not going to lie, Anna does seem to be experiencing some type of addiction towards this paint thinner, which I think aids in the reason as to why she feels the need to keep wanting to go back onto the streets, which is just a cynical cycle of like a consequence of what happens when you are in such poverty that you move to the streets. Like I'll get into later. It's just, it's, it's fucking sad. Like Mm. one of the reasons that they're kind of, her parents are kind of okay with her leaving is because they're like, Oh, well she'll make more money out on the streets than she would here. So it's like, it's, I get into it a little bit more, but it's it's fucked. And that's kind of like the reality of what they live in. And then when you watch the documentary, it's, all fucking fucked like i'm not quite sure if the brother marian was a user of Aralok or the paint thinner that they huffed but there was definitely a point in the documentary where anna is so strung out on drugs that she can't like properly fill her bag with more paint and so the brother's like no let me like I know how to do it and he's like no you have to shake it first you have to shake it like you're not shaking it hard enough you're not gonna like (laughs) it's just (sighs) sad I'm laughing how much younger is her brother he's eight and she's ten but at the point of the documentary she's 16 so he's like No, no 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 Christina is 16 Oh, so shit. at the time of the documentary, Anna is 10 and he is eight. It's like, I'm sorry and I'm laughing, but it's like an awkward laugh because like I watch this and I don't know how humanity can be like this. It Because just last episode, I was saying like every child should feel like that joy of having that outfit that you're so excited to wear, like, you wear it to sleep that night, and it's like, no, these kids don't fucking feel that, you fucking privileged bitch. You need to (laughs) sit down and appreciate. Mm -hmm. But Anna would repay him by oftentimes beating him when she got high, (laughs) and they would, like, show in the documentary. But it's... It's really hard because I'm I'm like I'm not trying to talk shit about Anna. There were really times where she would be super sweet with her brother and they did have a very caring and like close bond with each other. It's just hard because she's addicted to this substance and a lot of times you're going to put the substance over your family no matter how close you are. So it's mm-hmm. just like one of those you see her often take it out on her brother who she loves so fucking much so was she on other drugs besides the pain i mean i don't like substance i should say i don't know she was only 10 but i know like later on other kids do get into harder drugs but when they're this young it doesn't seem like they do it seems like they just stay on the paint i could be totally wrong but from what I, the information I was given. You could often tell that a child was huffing Oralac, though, by this, like, silver stain or (sighs) slight, like, silver hue that would be left on the children's mouth and hands after they were done inhaling it. pictures of that. Okay. I have seen pictures of that. But this silver hue is how we're introduced to our next child, Macarena, who is 14. 
Now, her story is quite similar to Christina's. They actually grew up in the same orphanage, um, but she never knew her parents, never knew what happened to them. She also never knew her birthday or even her name and actually got her name Macarena in the orphanage and throughout the streets because it was said that when she was growing up, she really liked to dance to the Macarena. Mm. Uh, Wikipedia did have her name, as well as the ending credits of the documentary, had her name listed as Violetta Russo, though. So I do believe that that is what her name is documented as. Okay. Her, <laughs> I'm not trying to laugh, but it's just like her introduction. One, she's huffing pain her intro is her having the biggest bag and she throughout the documentary is always almost always about 90 percent of the time seen with some kind of silver paint on her Mm. and in her words she says i am the most street kid the most orlac kid and with this paint nearly constantly on her like she very much sticks to her name (laughs) it's like she's not very far off from her words Uh, there is one scene in the documentary where she's pouring orlac into a plastic bag because that's like how they huff it they'll get a grocery bag or some kind of plastic bag pour it in there and then they like do this thing with their hands and then they like huff it and so when she goes to pour the paint she like put the puts the cap back on goes to put it back in her pocket and then like when she's messing with the bag to huff it the vial of paint falls out and she goes and she grabs it while this other kid sees what's happening and he goes that's my paint that's my paint you just picked up my paint and macarena is so like fucked up that she's like oh oh shit okay like after he keeps saying it she's like okay and so she hands him this like almost full vial of paint and as soon as he hands he gets it he's like haha I tricked you I tricked you this was your paint like I'm and she just like starts crying and she's like give it back please like I'm just watching this and I'm like I can't imagine being the woman behind this camera like watching all of this go down and that is a very common occurrence and they will be doing this out on the street people will be walking by there was one scene where a kid was like they were like why are you foaming at the mouth he was drooling and then he goes uh where the people are going out on from the subway onto the street he's standing right at that entrance and sarah how you were saying you were in your dream (laughs) earlier before we started recording he was just standing like this like just standing there and people were walking right by him like not a care in the world a lot of people in the society have it seems like they've been very accustomed to seeing stuff like that and to just completely ignore it yeah oh my god In Macarena's words, she states that people would often give her money to buy food, but she would just use it to buy more Orlac instead. Uh, Because in her words, if I get one bottle, I'm no longer hungry. It's like paradise. You dream that you eat, and I just can't give that up. Oh my god. The last child in the documentary that we are introduced to is Mihai. He left the house when he was about eight or twelve, or eight or nine, and he is about twelve at this time. Now, Mihai left his home. He didn't outright state that he was being abused in his household, but in his words, his father just made the house unlivable. And with his father in that house, there was no way that Mihai would be able to live in that house as well. Mm-hmm. He would say that his father would drink at least a liter of vodka a day and afterwards shout at the family. And though he is a kid living out on the streets, it is, he is one of the more like inspiring children that you'll see. And you'll even see, uh, if you do watch the documentary, social workers will even tell his family later on, like, you don't see a lot of children with his mentality. And he's like one of the very few 
who is able, these people, <laughs> society is just kind of like really fucked up with these kids, but they'll say like, if you spend a few weeks or like a month at most on the streets, then these kids are unrehabilitatable. Like, is that the right word? But you can't like, they're, they're no good after a month. They're addicted and they're a waste and there's no point. But they would say with him, like, because he's been on the street for a very long time, years, and they're like, he's the only kid that we've seen that, like, really has this kind of attitude that could maybe, like, he has a chance to... Like, life to him. Yeah. Not be addicted. He... Like, he hasn't given up hope. I, I don't, like, I, I don't want to say that he doesn't do drugs. Like, I think he may have tried it, but I don't think he's, like, addicted by any means. It's, like, the street life isn't for him. And you see when he talks, like, he will tell Adette, like, when he first meets her, I never beg for money. I I don't want anything evil to happen to me. I, I don't f- see the value in begging. I want to work for my money. And so he'll like go to the shopkeepers and he'll do chores for them and whatnot. Um, but he'll also tell her like he likes to read poems. He really mm. enjoys school. Like one of the things that he loves about living on the streets is that he's free because he comes from an abusive household. But one of the worst things that comes with living on the street is that he's cut off from his education and that Mm. he can't do what he wants in life and on top of this he's like very for a little boy like so extremely religious like there's one point where they're like going past this certain part on the train I don't know if they like pass across or whatnot but he just like starts doing the little like father son holy spirit I'm just like yeah, Hail Mary, whatever. I'm fucking not religious Aren't anymore. Are you Catholic? I am, yeah. <laughs> I, got, I got my coronation or whatever it's called. <laughs> but yeah, he's just like, he's, I don't know. It's just like, breaks my heart when I see him. There is one social worker that I do see throughout this whole documentary that would like go and try and help these children. This like group of, of children living in the subway there's more than five of them it's just this documentary focuses on five like there's a huge ass group about twenty thousand estimated during this time so fucking a lot uh but the social worker's name was angie breda and she would often go to see them and take them to the doctor to try and go get medical care ask them how they're doing just do like kind of an overall checkup on all of them She would take a few of them to Heart and Hand, which is unfortunately one of only two of the day clinics that were offered in Bucharest at the time that provided any type of basic medical care to these children, meaning that they were able to take a shower for the first time in weeks. They were able to finally get a full meal. They were able to get their hair cut because some of them had lice or able care or just like so they would offer medical care like Anna did go in with a stomach ache but if you were on drugs they were not really that likely to give you medicine that would make you feel better because as the nurse stated the medicine is expensive and it's not worth it for me to give it to you if you're just like gonna go out and do drugs which I guess I understand yeah but it fucking... I get it, but it sucks. It sucks. It sucks. How I, because it's hard enough to deal with an adult that is an addict. I can only imagine a child that is an addict (laughs) because there is no, no, what's the word that I'm looking for? Limit. There's no, like, you have no threshold. You have no, like, capacity to, like, there's a better word for it, but you have, no limit to you. You're just like, go, go, go. So I guess these children were, they had some access to medical care, but it was very, very limited. If you were a child taking drugs, you're basically getting probably band-aids and maybe some like neosporin to put on a cut. And that was the extensive, extensive to like what you were getting. But out of all of the problems that children faced while living on the streets, hunger was by far the biggest issue for them. 
uh, it's not <laughs> all I'm thinking of like is Kim Kardashian's you better get off your ass and work well it's not like <laughs> it's not like 10 year olds can get off their asses and work they're literally like fucking 10 years old and they have the mentality of a 10 year old and it's like 10 year olds shouldn't have to like live under those circumstances that along with the fact that even if they were to work countless hours bringing stuff from to and fro from the merchant like bringing supplies in and whatnot these children aren't going to be able to have a livable wage to like buy an apartment or buy food or buy this or that like the merchants are giving them scrap money because they know that they can skim these kids for whatever it's just like all of these issues are going forth and you have 20,000 of them out on the streets it's they are ha- there's no <laughs> there's no way for them to get up and work and simply like fix the problem away it's not like i i i don't know they I'm didn't str- create the problem so it's not their problem to fix even though they are seen as the problem just wait just wait because there's a priest that has something to add on to what you just said <laughs> But I think, like, one of the most eye-opening realizations, and I'm sure on YouTube we're going to get fucking some crazy-ass comments about it, because that's the only place we tend to get weird-ass comments, but, like, society had a totally different viewpoint on this topic than, I guess, we do. And it's maybe because society was taught that it's okay to treat like, people like this or in that country versus America or like 20 no. years ago versus today no i guess i would just say maybe not because we do treat our homeless population like shit and maybe it's not that different as to how we treat people now but maybe just watching it through a TV screen and seeing it from a third person point of view, it was really fucked up to see how like one of the social workers is talking to Mihai, who was abused by his dad. That's why he left the home. And the social worker is like, oh, well, it's not that big of a deal. You know, I beat my children. And I'm like, that's not what you tell an abused child you know that's called oversharing ma'am yeah it's called uh breaking ethical boundaries for s- okay there's it's and it's not that's just like the tip of the iceberg there's just stuff that is said that i'm like that's not right i don't think that's logical and if you think that way i think that's really fucked up but it it's just i i don't want to like blame them as a person i just want to say like i think that's just the way that they were raised in society does that make it right I don't know I'm not trying to call them out like I'm really not trying to be a bitch but I I I watch it and I look and I'm like hmm hmm we really think that way about that hmm Hmm. maybe I need to try better as a human being if this is our standard because shit people no everything's gone to shit we're all shit it is insane it was just like really crazy to see Really just like their lack of, sim- they they really do not see these children as anything more than a nuisance, not something that they need to feel sympathy for because this is a problem that they created. It's more like, oh, well, they're there and they're an eyesore and it's really annoying. They should just kind of like leave and you'll see like later on because I do a follow up from like 2015 was the latest that I could get about it. Like it's still an ongoing problem and you see they really just like push them further underground. It's really disgusting. But scenes throughout the entire documentary, like I had said, would show people walking past them without so much as a second glance um, or they would even go as far as hitting the children if they were inconvenienced by whatever the children they were doing. One of the days, Macarena was actually so hungry to the point where she just like had a full-blown meltdown. She couldn't take it anymore. She just wanted some food. And so she began like crying and maybe screaming. And like, yes, it was really loud, But I'm like, if you are so hungry to the point where you're having a breakdown, like, that is not, you screaming is not the biggest problem there. 
Right. And that's actually so fucking sad. Like, oftentimes she would stand by merchants and she would, like, do tiny tasks for them or whatnot. And they would have to, like, shoo her away. They're like, oh, well, once the customer leaves, then you can beg them for money. But she's constantly, it's sad because then she doesn't use that money for food. She goes to buy fucking drugs with it. But... There's one time where she's having a full-blown meltdown because she is so hungry and she just wants food. And Christina, during the documentary, would tell Odette that, you know, like, she had the sudden premonition that Macarena really needed Christina and that Christina just had to go over and see what was going on. And so while Christina goes to see what's going on, a debt would capture on film an adult man approaching Macarena while telling her to basically like shut the fuck up and begin to beat her, punch her and kick her multiple times while she is on the ground screaming. Christina would have to get in between them in order to stop the man from beating Macarena any further. And according to Christina, this was actually a very common occurrence to happen to Macarena and to happen to other street kids. But particularly with Macarena, I would said that Christina said that she would often get so high that she couldn't even remember her name and that people, particularly the merchants or particularly the passerbys like though like I don't want to disregard the street people were also violent but Christina would say that oftentimes it was like the fucking well-dressed citizens that were beating on her and doing all that shit to her and if they aren't fighting with this like I don't know what to call them if they're not fighting with like the middle class Locals. or <laughs> Oprah because I don't want to call them citizens because they're all fucking citizens <laughs> if they're not fighting with like the middle or upper class citizens of Romania then they're fucking fighting with the other lower class or homeless kids within the territory there was like one scene where Christina literally has to like drag and like beat this kid with a stick that she has while he's like screaming because a lot of them are mentally ill and you have like you have to fight for your territory if you are potentially letting this one homeless kid in they may become violent it's just like it's this whole fucking it reminds me of like um walking dead in a really fucked up way like when the world goes to shit and you go back to those basic primitive things of like you set up those groups you set up those territories and it's like if a new territory comes in you're fucking like real sketchy about them because when you take away food when you take away basic comforts from humans they get real fucking nasty and the true colors show and it gets real scary real fast. So, and if they're not worrying about the homeless kids or the middle to upper class, they're fucking having to worry about the shopkeepers that they're trying to buy their drugs from. <laughs> because a debt, a debt, the director of this would catch on film. I don't know if she was the one filming this. I believe she was. But she would catch a scene where Marianne was going into the hardware store to buy paint because that's, it's that easy for these kids. And the shopkeeper, one of the people standing next to her would even be like, oh my God, look, she's filming. And they'd be like, oh, well, we don't care. Cause like what? We don't care that we're getting kids high because it's an obvious problem. You see these kids huffing paint and you probably know that the second they walk out that door, they are opening that bottle and doing it right outside of the store. So like, yeah, and they're probably asking for a few extra plastic bags. Yeah. So it it's not, it's obviously known what's going on. Shopkeepers don't give a fuck. So they're like, whatever. If really giving paint out to these children, but then at least I guess the shopkeeper was nice enough to say, oh, cause they have to pay for it. And then show the receipt to get the item. Well, at least the shopkeeper was nice enough to be like, oh, the cashier gypped you. She charged you for two bottles when you're only getting one. Go back to the cashier and ask her for your change. So like these shopkeepers and cashiers will see that these kids are coming in high or probably knowing that they can't do math because a lot of them aren't educated and will tell like 
tell them a total or have them give them money and then just give them a certain amount back and be like, yeah, that's fine. And then they steal money from them because you have to you have to think at the time everyone during this time is poor a good majority of them it's not like I wasn't able to get a statistic on like how many is middle to upper class versus lower but it seems that a lot of people during this time were struggling because of the debt that the uh, leader was trying to make the citizens pay like it made everyone poor yeah um like instead of middle upper class it was probably like lower middle and upper (laughs) yeah you would have one person i guess kind of that would try and help it was also kind of weird english sister mary murphy of the confirmation faithful companion of jesus she would tell the documentary that she saw anna and marianne on the streets and wanted to help them But it's kind of weird because she is, like, rushing them into the car. And then, like, this one other kid tries to get into the car. And she's like, ah, 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 no, get out. (laughs) And I'm not trying. It's not funny. It's really sad. But, like, these other kids, Macarena has a full-blown meltdown. Because Anna, she's like, Anna's going to go get new clothes. And, uh this sister isn't going to let me get new clothes because she saw me hitting the bottle. She saw me using drugs. And because she saw me using drugs, I'm not going to get these new clothes. But she like even went up to the sister and was like, Anna uses drugs. Check her pockets. She has pain in them right now. Like it's a fucking battlefield out there. Like they, they want the help. But the sister was like, I don't care. We're going to you know, go and take them to the shelter. So she goes and she takes them to the shelter and it gets really fucking weird because the shelter is basically like the only way that we're going to take them is if we stay, if they stay clean, if they're clean of drugs and basically like if they want to stay and Anna being Anna, as soon as When you watch the documentary, you can tell kind of straight away she's really agitated. It almost looks like as if she wants to leave and kind of go back onto the streets. To me, it's kind of like me when I want to go and hit my fucking vape pen. (laughs) I just like need to get that quick little hit. And that is seriously how she looks as a 10 year old sitting here in this little thing. And then you have Marion and he's sitting in the other corner and he's drawing a picture and he's seemingly having like a really nice time. And the workers at the shelter are talking with the sister and basically saying like, well, we don't know if we can help them. We thought that you talked to them before. Now that you haven't talked to them and it doesn't seem like she wants to go, I really don't think that there's anything that we can do to keep them. We only keep clean children or children that seem that they could be rehabilitated. And it doesn't seem like that's what we have here. And so... They ask Marion if he wants to sleep at this shelter, and when he doesn't answer the workers, he would look at the sister Mary and say, you know, it's really terrible of you to just take him and dump him in a shelter, the shelter being like the place that they're at now, because it seems like he's fine where he is, that being the streets in which he's living the worker would then go on to tell the sister Mary, like I had said before, the children really only have a few weeks or a month at most at being on the streets in order to like to be saved after that. So after a few weeks or a month of being on the street, there's really no chance of them being the children to be saved. They're right, usually like there's no chance of Uh, rehabilitation they're usually too addicted at this time people are probably so annoyed with how i'm talking but i'm also a little tipsy so sorry (laughs) they continue to spend like the next five minutes listing more reasons as to why they basically can't take these two children off the streets and marion like begins to doze off during this time and Noticing this, the workers then, you know, like, wake him up and then promptly 
kick them the fuck out yeah, of the shelter. Like, okay, gotta go now. Like, <laughs> Back to the streets you go, sir. There is one, one school open in Boot. Uh, Bucharest for the street children and this is called the open house now here they offer schooling like they learn how to write do math simple uh, educational things like that and they also get food but again like many things it is under the condition that the children stay clean while they are attending such facilities now Macarena unfortunately gets suspended a lot from this open house school Mm. And during the time of the documentary, at least during part of it, because during some she is in the open house, but um, at some point she does get suspended from going there because she was found to have Orlac stains on her pants. But you do kind of see a sudden shift in how she acts, um, being in the open house when she is sober versus when she is out of it. And it just kind of shows you the lengths at which these children's lives are diminished because some law was put into place Mm. the workers at open house would say that macarena was very punctual and hardworking, um but they just really couldn't seem to get her to want to quit the drug the open house would also help children register into schools within the district and help children And help children get their identity papers, which either they don't have because they lost or, you know, they never really knew where it was to begin with. Or or like they don't have because they ran away. Mm -hmm. And their parents just refused to outright give it to them. Mihai actually goes into the school. And so when he is in the school, you actually hear him state that I would like to have a family of my own. I would like my own child, my own friend, and for this, I need my papers so I can go to school. Social workers would even go as far as making an appointment to meet with uh, Mihai's parents in order to get this paperwork taken care of. But when they went, Mihai was really adamant on not going to see his family. I believe four social workers went with them and he said, two of y'all can go to see my parents. Two of y'all can stay with me. When the social workers went, they were met with Mihai's mother, sister, or siblings. I don't know how many siblings he had, but he really adamantly talks about his mother and sister. So that's why I keep saying mother and mm-hmm. sister. But there were other people in the house with them. So Gotcha. They would say to Adette and the rest of the crew there that they missed Mihai desperately and they wanted nothing more than to have him back home and that if he were to come back home, you know, nothing would happen to him. The mother admitted that a child had to be caressed as well as spanked and Though she didn't beat them regularly, she would give a good beating just once a year. But that fear was something that really needed to be instilled in a child in order for them to be able to respect people when they get older. But regardless, she simply could not give them the identity papers. Uh, She didn't have a copy Mm. as she flaunted it, like, in front of their faces and she said that the shops were closed and that as soon as they opened on monday she would go ahead and send it to them okay the workers that were there for mahai would then also tell or would then tell the family like hey well since we're here why don't you go ahead and write a letter to him why don't anything you want to say, just go ahead and say it now. It will be a lot faster for us to give it to him than for you to write it. Uh, because he had stated like right before they went that he had written to them quite some time ago, but they like never responded to him. And oh. that was another reason why he didn't feel like comfortable going they back. they miss him so much. Like, okay. In the letter, they would tell him like, Again, yeah, we miss you so much and that nothing would happen to you if you were to come back. And 
when I first watched this, like, I'm not gonna lie, I, I watched this and I was like, oh, go back. They miss you. They love you so much. But when you go, when Adet goes to interview the father in Bucharest, where he happens to stop by when he's fishing, as soon as the interview's done, I'm like, oh, you did the right thing by staying. Never go back. <laughs> it mm-hmm. is very, it, immediate red flags. Um Ugh. His father, Ion Tudos, would state, I want him to be okay. I want this with all my heart. He would go on to say that, you know, he never beat Mahai. He doesn't know what's wrong with him. He doesn't know what's wrong with the son or why he would want to leave home. Quote, once I chained him by the neck so that he wouldn't leave anymore. I tied him to the radiator. He disappeared from the home chain around his neck (laughs) that may (laughs) no freaking clue why my son would run away but i okay yeah but no clue but no idea like okay i have a soul he would state (laughs) where is it i'm also a rather emotional guy you know (laughs) He would even go on to say, like, if I had a piece of chocolate and it was the last piece, like, I would give it to him. And I'm like, but you would tie him by his neck with a chain to a radiator. Yes. And you never beat him. Okay. Very puzzling to me. And if he were to ever return... No, it gets worse. It gets worse. Because if he were to ever return... Mahai would be sent to a special hospital in Sabui because his father just, like, had no other way. Had no other way of curing him, so he had to send him to a special hospital where doctors could deal with him and fix him. Cure him of what? I don't know. Was he gay? No, he was just a fucking kid. Ugh. Like, it It was literally... The, like, I don't know, because... <laughs> like we we get into it Anna's mom kind of like low-key goes the same route later on I don't know if it's a common thing theme here like a lot of Christina will later go on to say that she has mental health issues but I'm like how can you one use drugs and that extent and two be homeless and like that much traumatized because your parents didn't want you and not have some type of mental health issue like yeah it's hard to be normal when you've been traumatized so much through life like ptsd is a fucking thing and that can definitely affect you growing up mentally especially like experiencing it at such a young age so well yeah adverse childhood experiences cause increase in um negative outcomes in adulthood which um involves the occasional substance abuse addiction and mental health disorders yeah. so but we want to stop that is accelerated caring. at a young age i can only imagine yeah and we want to stop caring about life as soon as they're born but if this doesn't infuriate you maybe this next event will because everyone during this time like is a a a fucking apparently orlac is like rampant in the water system because everyone's fucking cuckoo kachoo so here's the priest the priest that i was talking about so we have a priest from (laughs) stravopoleus stravopoleus would approach macarena and the group but mainly this discussion was between him and macarena and He would go up to her and basically ask, you know, how did you get into this situation? And Macarena would reply, oh, you know, it's because of my parents. I'm, they didn't want me, so here I am. And this guy would retort, oh, and why are you blaming them? Why are you going to blame the parents? Why is it always the first thing that you do is blame the parents, blame other people? He would then go on to ask, uh, would you be on the streets if someone offered you help? And, like, would you stay in an orphanage? And Macarena would be like, yeah, I would stay, you know, like, as long as they don't beat me. And the priest probably thinking, like, oh, shit, well, we beat them. Mm -hmm. 
turned it into, oh, no, it's not because of that. It's because you children prefer to live on the streets where your drugs are easily accessible. Because, you know, my church, the Stravama Popo her, her, Police <laughs> Church, <laughs> you know that we offer help, right? But you know we only offer help to those children that are clean. We don't offer help to the worst of the worst because God said that's too much work and we can't do that. And then he goes on to say, like, I don't really think, I don't believe you when you say that no one's offered you help. And then he turns to the camera because the dead is filming this. And he goes, tell it to the Americans. Say that it's no use trying to help us, to help y'all, because y'all refuse and choose to stay on the streets. Oh, fuck. It's harsh. May God help you, he would finally say before Uh. leaving them all. And it's really fucking sad because these are the children that need the most fucking help. Yeah. So for you to say, may God help you, but I'm not going to be the one to do it. (laughs) These are the people who don't need anyone else to give up on them. It's truly i have nothing to do but smile because i'm so upset like i know people don't understand people grieve in different ways this is how i grieve by fucking making terrible ass jokes and being so fucking upset because i it's one thing to be blatant and to be ignorant and to ignore everything that's around you but to one be a priest the a fucking audacity and two to go up to children Who've, like, you haven't experienced even 0.01% of the suffering that these children have felt. And then to go up to them and say, oh, you're blaming other people because God never gave you a chance to have rightful parents. It's like fucking luck of the draw that you were born in the circumstance that you were born in. Like that We don't get to fucking choose to be born, when we're born, who we're born exactly. to. Exactly. That easily we're... could have been you, Mr. Priest, fucking addicted to Orlac, fucking sniffing paint, but by luck of the fucking draw, you were born in a different circumstance. And because of that, you're gonna use that as an excuse to look down upon fucking they are 12 year olds 14 year olds that you're arguing with the saying screw you because you're on drugs we're not gonna help you while you mr priest are going and telling people love thy neighbor be the better person if you want god to accept you into heaven you need to be this certain way even though fucking you don't even know how to do a proper baptism right and fucking half the people in america aren't properly baptized Fuck all y'all bitches. For real. Religion is... We need it, but goddamn, so fucking stupid at times. Anywho. That was a rant. I didn't mean to go on, but... <sighs> I'm like, we need oh, it, but God damn it. That scene really did done fucking piss me off. I was really upset. I'm just like, I, I really don't understand how an adult can look at a child who is suffering and say that. Well, and then also, like, hmm, wary be the one who seeks help from the church. If you're on drugs, no way ye turn around. <laughs> well, no, just because they're fucking corrupt as fuck regardless. <laughs> with Especially with 13-year-old boys. Not saying it's like the Catholic church or anything, but like, no. just... Uh, it's very common in every single type of church, so. No, oh, it is. Um, but one of, I think, it's all eye-opening, but one of the more sobering parts of this documentary was a part where Anna was getting extremely high off of Orlock, and there was a scene earlier in the documentary where all the kids found a park, and it had, like, a nice little pond or, like, a man-made little pool where they were all going around and splashing and having fun and it just seemed like a grand old time so Anna got really high one day and she's like I really want to go back to this park this seems like a great day I want to relive it let's go back and so it was Harris Thrall Park and they're going around trying to find this park 
they can't really seem to find it. They end up in this one park that obviously isn't it. And Anna has a full blown meltdown. She starts sitting on this bench and very much like any child would starts like sobbing and just has a good cry. Mm. But being high on drugs, she is like blaming other people. She's like, fuck your ancestors, you cocksucker, <laughs> suck my dick. Like, I want to find this park. Fuck this park. Fuck everyone in here. It's just like this crazy language coming out of this 10-year-old who is having a meltdown because she's not like probably going through some sort of withdrawal Mm -hmm. and she's coming down yeah is not getting like the help that she needs mahai is sitting on the bench that she just so happens to sit next to it's originally like her mahai and two kids in between them and she starts having her meltdown and one kid's like okay fuck this i'm gonna go play with my ball (laughs) and the other kid's like that sounds like a great idea and so it's just anna and mahai on the bench and then anna gets to the point where she's getting so belligerent that she begins to actually like beat Mahai and yeah. starts like kicking him and uh hit punching him and it gets to a point where a passerby has to go in and break them up because it's getting so rough and this next scene is like a major trigger warning for self-harm so like skip over about 30 seconds if you don't want to hear but after uh, this breakdown, Mahai would go into another corner and actually begin cutting his own arm with, I I really didn't see what he had, but he had something and he began slashing at his arm, cutting himself, basically saying that this is, I'm doing this because of her. It's her fault that I'm doing this. And, and unfortunately, this practice was not uncommon throughout street with street kids. Um, Christina appears later on in an article where she's like 30 something and her forearm is covered, covered in scars. It is like a very common practice. Even Anna, like her stepfather goes on to point out later on in the documentary, like he raises her forearm and he's like, look at these cuts. Normal kids don't cut themselves like this, but I'm like, every fucking street kid does that. It's really not an uncommon practice and it's really sad. Like, it's not a normal kid you're talking about. And I if know. there is a normal one, but. Yeah. There was a, a, also a lot of animosity going on during this time in the documentary between Anna and other kids. Because, unlike a lot of the other kids that were living in the subway at the time, Anna had parents that she willingly left home from and I don't think she made it any better uh, because it was said that she would brag about her family or her Mm. family life when the documentary was actually like going to go visit her family she would brag like oh that's my dad's job like my dad works there blah 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 so I think this bragging like really didn't help the emotions that the other kids were feeling towards her coming from children that didn't even know who their parents were and like had no option but to be in this situation and then you have this one girl coming in who's like oh i have a home but i'm just choose to leave it yeah anna deep in her addiction would even go as far as stealing paint bags from the other kids or at least being accused of stealing the paint bags i don't it's not really like proven or disproven whether she steals them or not But the other kids had their minds made up that Anna was the one that stole it. And the documentary would catch all of these kids going to gang up on her and then proceeding to beat her fairly badly. She ended up getting her face kicked in and they were even threatening, like, I will push you off the second floor of the subway train. Like, it was very brutal, very violent. And she was very badly beaten after this. Uh, I think the beating kind of shook her so much to the point where she decided, I actually want to go home. And so she would go on the train and you would see, like, she had this huge bandage covering her face from where the person had kicked her in, basically. Oh, my God. 
in Sinai, which is where Anna and Marion live, they would approach the small home where Anna's mother lived. Uh, answering the door, Anna's mother seemed quite embarrassed when they were first introduced. She would later go on to state that, you know, she has been unemplo- unemployed for quite some time and she's quite anxious because she doesn't even have coffee that she could offer them. She's very much living a day-to-day type of Mm. situation. She would go on to talk about how her and her husband had actually separated and that he too had become an employed. So Anna was basically just speaking lies about her father still working and how her parents were still together and whatnot. Anna's mother would go on to say that they often didn't have food for days at a time And because of this, Anna would often leave the home. And with trains being so expensive, it became nearly impossible for Anna's mother to go and search for her every time that Anna decided to leave the house. Anna's stepfather would come in later on and really tell you how he feels. Mm. (laughs) He's, He's kind of a dick, in my opinion. Who knows? He would state that, you know, the mother cries at night and y'all should be worried sick about her and she misses y'all so much no matter how sick that these children are she uh the stepfather would say doesn't matter if they're a murderer a criminal anything like that i would love them no matter what Mm-mm. in a way i miss them he says but i spent four years with anna and it was four years of torture i almost wanted to leave their mother because of it yeah oh, damn And when it came time to basically decide if, like, Anna and Marion should leave or if they should stay home, the mom and stepdad sat down with them and were like, hey, what do you want to do? Do you want to leave or do you want to stay? And the mom really tried to plead. She's like, I I can't force you to stay here with me because if I force you, you're going to be gone in two to three hours or you're going to be gone in a few days. So it's best if you leave now and me not worry about you, I guess, than like for us to stay and then you randomly be gone and it just be a whole debacle. And as fucked up as it is, you really, I guess... I don't know if it's the addiction. I don't know if it's the mindset. I really don't know what Anna chooses about the streets that she loves so much. But at the end of the day, Anna would decide that it was better for her to stay on the streets. And then Marion ultimately would decide to go and follow her. Wow. Of the aftermath of all of this, uh, just one year later during a police sweep of Piata Victoria... Victory, Anna and Marion would be picked up for vagrancy and put into a temporary state shelter. Police would threaten Anna's parents with child abandonment if they did not take the now 14-year-old in. And because of this, Anna now lived back at home, lives back at home with her parents or her mom and stepdad. Anna would state that she was happy to be back home uh, and was seen in the documentary playing with the neighborhood kids afterwards. Though her mom would state she's impulsive, she's irritable, she has no patience, and would also give talk about how she was wanting to place her into some sort of hospital slash school where she could be taken care of and get some schooling for she called it kind of like an ailment or maybe a disease but it was basically like this i don't know what anna has <laughs> she just seems very like maybe it's add maybe it's maybelline i don't know <laughs> she, she just like needs she needs something it's very she's like very high energy and i think the parents yeah i don't know So that is the most I got from her. I'm wishing her the best. As for her brother, Marion, Marion was deemed able for rehabilitation during this police sweep and was placed under state custody. And while he was placed into state custody, he would later be admitted into a private residential center called Casa Robin Hood. 
And here he would seem really happy and well-adjusted. He stated that he really liked getting to play with all the children and being able to have a place to stay at night. And like I said, seemed really happy overall. As for Mihai, he would uh, move out of the subway station towards the end of the documentary and would end up staying with a mother and child in a rundown building. The woman would state that she often saw the Orlac kids beating up Mihai and that they would often steal his money. And because of this, she offered him a place to stay with her and her baby girl. Mm-hmm. She would state, he's not a care... A careless child. He is quiet, well-behaved, and he listens to me. I trust him. I can leave him with the girl and go to the market. One can rely on him. Mm-hmm. Of his current situation, Mahai would say, life is hard. Very hard. I think he, which I'm assuming is like the police that were coming in and doing all the sweeps in an attempt to like get rid of the homeless... But I'm not a thousand percent sure. But he said, I think he will come soon and nobody will know where we will go. Either underground or high up. Some are unfortunates. Others have the bag. We We are all poor souls. Good or bad, only God knows. I did an evil thing leaving home. From my father, my parents, my sister. But with my father, I can't stay. Hmm. He would continue to leave on, live on the streets until he was severely beaten and decided to eventually return home. But just two months after being back home, he would decide to move back onto the streets again and live with Christina at the construction site where she currently lives, which I'll get into right after this. Okay. From there... He goes to move into the Arms Center for Street Children, which was due to the fact that the elder boys at this construction site treated him really fucking terribly. Christina said that they would go as far as pushing him off of the second floor onto the ground Jesus. level if they didn't bring him enough money. They would yeah. tell him, like, you need to bring us a certain amount of thousands of dollars uh, from begging or we don't care how you get it but if you don't give us this amount of money you're in deep trouble and Mihai would say like it was just like too exorbitant of an amount for me to give so oftentimes I would end up getting beat yeah in fact two of the boys would beat him so badly that Mihai went into a coma and almost died and two of the boys ended up in jail those two boys ended up in jail for the beating but Yeah. But overall, Mahai's faith and hope for an education and love overall for God really inspired a German man who watched the documentary. And this man, I believe he was from Belgium, spent six months looking for Mahai in Bucharest. And he actually found him and was able to, I guess, bring him back with him. I I hope it wasn't in a weird way. I don't think it was. But he was able to offer him, like, an education, a home, Mm -hmm. and give him some type of living situation before, ultimately, he returned back to Bucharest to live with a social worker. Okay. As for Christina, during that same police sweep that... Anna and Marianne went back home towards or went back home for Christina would end up being forced to leave Piata Victoria Victoria yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> which is that uh, subway station that all the children were living at from here she would be forced to move to an abandoned construction site which Mahai would later join her at But this construction site was controlled by an older group of boys, and this group was not necessarily the nicest. Um, By the time that she had met back with the debt, she had grown out her hair and admitted that things had been kind of rough since moving over here. Uh, She didn't play the boss anymore. She often, like, things got too sad with her and the children. She, like, cared too much, I guess she would say, before ultimately confirming rumors that she 
would in fact get beaten up by the older boys that ruled the area Mm. Uh, but she would try to also say that she earned some respect by trying to fight back though it seems like the way that other kids describe this area was ultimately really violent like they don't show this group of boys but wowie they just take it to the next level and it really doesn't seem like anyone that lives in this construction site is safe from any type of harassment or physical violence and it's actually oh. like quite dangerous in 2013 at the age of 32 her and her boyfriend would be featured in an article discussing the homelessness in romania In this article, Christina would discuss how at the age of 19, she stated that she found herself addicted to heroin and three months pregnant. Uh, She, at that time, didn't have any aspirations for getting clean. And once the baby was born, much like she was, she would end up giving the child up for adoption. Uh, In the article, I believe she did know the woman that she gave in to. It was like a close family friend that she gave this child to. But from there, in one article, it discussed how she would continue living on the streets using the income from her girlfriend's prostitution, though I'm not 100% sure how true that was, as in one of the articles that I read that came from what seemed like an interview from Christina, Uh, She had all three children with the same man, so I'm not 100% sure how true that is, but after the adoption of her baby, she unfortunately continued to use heroin and would end up birthing two more children whom she also would end up giving up and now currently lives on the streets with her husband who unfortunately in that article did currently find out that he was HIV positive Mm. Um, and he did I believe, like, have pneumonia as well. And it was said that him and Christina shared needles. So it's kind Mm. of a slippery slope as to where that future may head. Uh, But she does hope to one day be reunited with her family. And hopefully one day it will be a possibility in the future that she could be clean. Uh, I wasn't... The last checkup I had, it was, like, around 2015. I wasn't able to get anything from 2022 on, so... Damn. A quote from Christina during the documentary uh, when she was asked about her life that I really wanted to share was when she would state, my life? Well, what can I say about my life? I feel deserted. I feel bad. I don't like being alone. I'd like to have a friend next to me. When asked if she believed in love, she stated, I don't believe in love. I believe in God because he's bigger. As for Macarena, she would continue living on the streets, uh, though not with the group that lived at the construction site. She stated that when she did live at the construction site, the bodyguards would beat her, the police that were there would threaten to shoot her, and she did not want to die, so she left. She would state at the end, you know, I'm not from this country, from Bucharest. I'm from another country. My mommy and daddy are waiting for me, but I can't go by myself because I don't have a passport. So I stay here in Bucharest. Yeah. While she talks, you can see the faint specks of silver paint around her mouth and hands. Mm. She would go on to talk about her twin, also named Macarena, and how she's currently still in school and happy, and how oftentimes... She would walk by her sister's old school and peek through the windows just to get a glance at how she's, how it's all going on. Mm. Something that I wanted to end on, because obviously that was really sad hearing. Yeah, I'm like, I'm sorry I haven't said much, but I am literally like depressed. Yeah, and I'm not really done yet. Um, but I, it's just to kind of help with the mentality of what these children were feeling. And it comes from something that one of the teachers said about Macarena during the documentary. She would state that she followed a very difficult path through many orphanages and institutions. Poor her. She doesn't know any more where she comes from, and I don't think she realized that she too was born of a mother, of a human being just like any of us. How hard that must be. 
True. Now the homeless children in Romania today have been pushed further down into the ground. An estimated 6,000 homeless people are now living in the heating and sewage system that runs under the city. And it's estimated that about a thousand of those people are said to be minors. As for the women's rights in Romania, much like the United States, the government is slowly making it harder for women for women to get an abortion. With one woman stating that in June of 2020, 55 out of the current 134 public hospitals questioned stated that they offered abortions. Mm. The number the following year dwindled down to just 28. The countryside birth rate seemingly rised with the statistic as they saw a spike in 2022. But Daniela de Gracci, I'm so sorry, I know I said that wrong, but she was a woman who endured the beginning laws of Romania in the 1970s and had to endure the dangers of an at home abortion in 1976. To the women of today, she gives these words of encouragement. Our wins are slim at this time, but they're here. I don't feel tired or discouraged. I keep doing it because many other people have just given up. But as an advocate, I know the key message is never give up. And that's what I'm doing. I'm not giving up. And that is the very long, depending on how I edited this (laughs) story. (laughs) Of the underground children of Romania, which oh, shit. is based off the documentary Underground Children. 10 out of 10 recommend you watching it. It was the most saddest thing I've watched in a really long time, but is a very eerie echo as to... <laughs> I'm not trying to be dramatic, but what happens when you force people to have birth because what happens when you force people to have birth and then don't give any of the necessary paths or resources resources, thank you when you don't give the necessary resources to those people after they have given birth or to those children after they are born it's devastating and I don't understand why we care so much about a life when we tend not to care about it after it's born so exactly Hopefully, this puts into perspective those consequences of what could happen when we force people to have children that they don't want. But at the same time, it's just, I'm not trying to, like, stand on any stance here at the end of the day. I know, like, what we talked about is very sensitive, but it's something that needs to be mentioned if we are going to have this whole argument that the United States is having right now because it's happened in history before and so are we going to let all of these lives literally go to waste because the government (laughs) I don't know what I'm trying to say here but mm. no it's okay when you first started telling the story I like figured it was going to be um talking about something from a longer time ago and not so recent so my mind is just blown honestly yeah it's it it blows my mind how it's something that they're still fucking dealing with because life is never ending and they will continue to have to deal with this like they're having to deal with the children that come from these children it's they don't think about consequences or aftermath no it, it's just pea brains because they're all men no It's really fucking sad. It's... uh, We gotta do better, folks. But yeah. Share it to someone who could use this. Hopefully, I said it right. I sure hope I did. I know the 19 crimes did not help me speak fluently, but... (laughs) It had to be said. It was a fucking whirlwind to watch. um, And just a really disgusting reminder of our past but just because it's really hideous to look at doesn't mean that we should not look at it and not talk about it so right exactly i wanted to get away from true crime so i decided to talk about this don't know if it's more fucked up or not but here we go well it's (laughs) kind of like a mishap murder mystery mishap Mm -hmm. 
people definitely one. fucking got killed over this, I'm sure. We don't just talk about true crime. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Until next time, guys. Hopefully I did that okay. Hopefully you enjoyed. If not, we have about a hundred more episodes to get it right because we're not going anywhere. <laughs> you can't get rid of us that easy. Doesn't matter because we're just doing it to talk, not even for the views. <laughs> All right, guys. Well, if you want a certain story, feel free to hit us up. R-A-R-W podcast. Mm, Yeah. Email. Red rum and red wine podcast at gmail.com. Outro. Bye. (laughs) Bye.